I'm Sandy Dumas and this is Alex Barrett-Leonard with us as well. So I'm, I'm currently doing the Deputy Head of Department role and, um, but have worked with the Fir Falls Pathway and setting it up since 2017 and Alex has taken over in the last year of ensuring it's been continued. Um, but we're not the only place, it's really a great team. So it was the brainchild of Professor Glenn Arentz and he's one of the ED consultants who has a special interest in elderly people and how they are managed in emergency department, departments. And we've actually worked very close together because it's all teamwork and it's downstream as well that it affects um, with Dr. Basker Mandel and he's the geriatrician, um, head, of, head of geriatrics at Fiona Stanley who has um, also facilitated a um, great effect, um, great changes downstream for our fallers. And then we've got the other geriatricians, Dr. Shivana Ahmed and Veda Kukulan, who um, work is in the team as well, as well as um, some other ED champions, Colleen Taylor and a registrar, Zoe Nicholson, that have had large roles to play. So I just want to acknowledge the whole team. So why did we choose um, falls? So what we do know is that um, falls are a very common um, presentation to an ED and often result in hospitalisation. Um, I'm not going to read through all the stats um, and there are thousands of um, 65 plus fallers that present to each emergency every year. Um, we, we prepared this presentation just over a week ago, but I believe the 2021 falls report um, came out last week. Somebody sent me 22. a copy. The 22 yeah. at least. And Alex actually tells me that she's actually written an article, which I proofread many moons ago, a few months ago. Yeah. So there is an article about us in there that I must actually look at <laughs> as well, which we will do shortly after this, Alex. We can go and have a look <laughs> if anyone wants to read it. Um, thanks, um, Alex, if you want the next slide. So why did um, Dr. Glenn Arendt um, have a special um, interest in, in setting up a pathway for these um, co this cohort in an emergency department? So when patients come into an emergency department and they're an, an older patient that's had a fall, they're often treated with extreme, um, what a very low priority. They're not patients that are loud, um, demanding, um, often just get left on a bed um, in the corner. They'll spend long time, a very long, often long times in waiting rooms on the A-bay and then are triaged to uh, multiple areas of ED before they finally get a ward transfer. So I was just down in ED on Wednesday and the consultants were saying that I think a cat three, I shouldn't share this, but should I? I'm not <laughs> spending 10 hours or so sometimes in um, be, um, before they actually get seen. Um, so then when they actually do require an admission, um, they get increased risk of hospital complications um, and they have increased length of stay. And there's a real lack of a, syst um, a systematic approach of how we actually manage them from the moment they present. And then, and, and then once we send them home, there's minimal referrals to outpatient clinics to reduce the risk. I've just come away from an hour ago listening to Tony um, Petter's um, talk on frailty and just one of the things that it's really hard to go backwards. So once you've kept them in hospital for five days, mm -hmm. that bit of function that they lose, they never regain. So it's really important that we um, minimise um, their journey in hospitals. So Colleen Taylor, who was on that first slide, did an audit in 2016 and um, worked out that there were about less than 50% which are, were discharged home and over 50% went to our acute medical unit. And then the average length of stay for anyone admitted was over five days. And you think just for a simple fall um, and resting in bed for five days is, is quite a long time. And most of them then go from the AMU ward to the geriatric ward and then out further downstream was Fremantle as well. So numerous bed changes. It was only 32% that actually were reviewed by Allied Health team and ED as well, because they're in multiple places and it's hard for us to actually pick them out too. Um, and then as a result of that, very um, fair were refused, referred to outpatient services. So let alone um, geriatric um, medical outpatient services as well. So, so that it, it showed to him, um, both the medical team, there was a clear need of how we could better address this population. The, the aim was to um, identify a path um, patients. And so we wanted to use an, an evidence-based breast practice approach and, and make it as standardised as possible. So if it was your grandmother attending an emergency department, they could get the best um, treatment possible on any day of the week and any time of night or day. We did want to give access to comprehensive geriatric assessment within the ED or if not immediately post-discharge. 
we wanted to increase our um, discharges directly from AD. We wanted a multidisciplinary review in, in AD, so that would include the geriatrician, pharmacist, allied health, um, as well as the ED consultants. And then have a better system for linking to outpatient services and better outpatient services too. Oh, sorry. Has a There's no sound, Sandy, oh. as they're supposed to be. Oh, yes, there was. I'm not sure how to do the sound from that. It was a video. Never, never mind. I hope you got the idea with the pictures. I'll talk you through it. It's just that chap was um, a 90 plus um, GP actually, and we'd set up the photographers that day, but he was a perfect example of a patient who got out of bed. He had quite severe um, OA of his knees, got out of bed that morning and his knee gave way and ended up on the floor, called an ambulance, and his knee swelled up um, quite quite badly and was quite um, quite an effusion with, um, at that point. Um, we There was no fracture, but it was just really um, acute on chronic OA. And he came in and he was um, had came straight to the short stay ward where which was under a part of our pathway. They miss you'll see their misassessment. Um, the, he didn't have to wait in the waiting room or on, in a bay. And by 10 o'clock, the ambulance officers actually could transport him to Frio where he needed a bit of rehab because his knee was hot and painful and he was struggling to walk. Had his imaging just after eight, the geriatrician saw him and the photographer came as we were getting him out of bed. The one back in bed was post his walk actually <laughs> as well. So just an indication of how quick and fast it can be with minimising time in ED. Yeah, so in 2021, 20% of the ED presentation, 65 years and older, that were categorised as three, four and five had presented with a fall. Um, and this is just a little graph. So as Sandy said, less than 50% were being discharged home from ED prior to the commencement of the falls pathway. And then I think it's one of the aims that Sandy mentioned was to try and improve discharge rates from the ED, which I think we can kind of say that they were successful in doing. Um, so over the last four years, between 70 and 74% of false patients are now being discharged home um, or back to their facility from ED, which is a nice little statistic. Um, so this is just a little snapshot of the front of the Falls Pathway document that we use, um, or the MR form um, that's used when the patient arrives to triage. Um, so we aim to target a specific group of patients to improve their flow and care and bypass busy areas such as resus and assessment. So they're streamed directly to short stay, which is a ward environment for assessment and input. Um, there's two designated beds that are for assessment in the short stay unit and then once they've been assessed they can move towards the management phase. So we often have kind of upwards of four or five falls pathway patients um, in the short stay unit at one time and then obviously on our computer screen or EDIS, we can see which patients these are and that obviously alerts allied health to you know what they've come in with and that the fact that they're on the pathway and at the front there's got the little inclusion and exclusion criteria for the the doctors and and everyone involved at the front kind of door there for them to make sure that they meet the criteria you can have a little look there triage the exclusion criteria includes triage patients one and two um, suspected NOF fractures, strokes, um, altered kind of conscious state and anyone that's on C-spine precautions generally um, need to have that cleared before they come through to short stay ideally. And I was just going to talk through the, um, this one and the ambulance you can see the top right the ambulance officers are at the triage area and they quite love us because generally we save some beds if possible all these fallers and they go straight to our um, short stay unit um, and then the second picture underneath the man with the bandage around his head is actually a patient in our short stay unit 
So this is quite different from going to an assessment unit because they're actually in a proper bed. Um, and it's actually a huge culture change. So when these patients come through, as you can see from this chap, they often have bleeding, they have fractures, and a short stay unit is usually a post assessment area in ED. So initially we had quite a few, a lot of resistance from the consultants and the registrars for having these unassessed patients where you just didn't know what was wrong with them arriving straight to a very quiet, um, you know, under-resourced area because there's a, the ratio of medical to patients is much less than a short stay unit. But we've um, certainly over the years overcome that and um, the benefits far outweigh um, having them going to the assessment unit. And there's just the documentation as they come through, the ambulance officers or the nurses pick up one of our false pathway sheets to make sure that right from the start, um, we assess them appropriately. And just another um, kind of visual display of how the pathway works and the flow through the emergency department for these patients, um, which I'll go into a little bit more now. And a couple of pictures of the team that were kind of around when the pathway started to be established um, and that that GP that Sandy spoke about from the video. Again, they're getting up and moving with the OTM physio. So as Sandy mentioned, there were a few aims of the pathway and one of them was that multidisciplinary assessment or access to the full team. So when the patient comes in on the falls pathway, um, there's a section for each of the groups, I suppose, of healthcare workers. So the nursing staff completed a risk screening tool, which includes screening for cognitive impairments and then other falls risks such as um, multiple medications, previous falls um, and things along those lines. And then they also have a little tick box section um, for things like postural blood pressures, um, urine analysis, um, ECG, BSL, just to cover some of the general, um, general basis of what these geriatric patients might be coming in with. I'm going to interrupt Alex. Um, when we didn't have the ticks box of what a, uh, you know, a, a thorough nursing assessment was, the nursing response was, oh, they'll do those assessments anyway. It's just part of what we do, but they didn't happen. Mm. But over the years, I love to see having those tick boxes. Mm. People like ticking the boxes, actually. And yeah. I hear I hear the nurses saying, and I'll do the urine and you do this. And they just like to yeah. get through. It's a little, little list. And it's yeah, standard. It so, that it get, make sure that it gets yeah. done, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it's an efficient, efficient way of doing it. Um, and then from there, it kind of goes on to the medical assessment. So if the patients come in overnight or early in the morning, generally they'll be seen by the geriatrician that services the short stay unit. Um, and then if they come in in the afternoon, often they'll be seen by the ED consultant with the option of being referred to our choice geriatrician, which we'll kind of talk about a bit later on. But basically what happens is that if an ED consultant sees the patient but thinks that they would benefit from um, a specific kind of targeted geriatric assessment, they can refer to um, an outpatient service, which is choice, and then the patient can then even go home and be seen or contacted by a geriatrician the very next day. So that's kind of a new service that's been set up here that some of you might have heard about and it's called the HOT Clinic. Um, and then obviously the geriatrician or the ED consultant will go through and look at bloods, medication, imaging, cognitive screen and refer on as needed. We have a pharmacist that now goes around in the morning with the geriatrician if they're there or the ED consultant can refer to in the afternoon. So looking at that medication review, seeing if there's anything that can be optimised from that point of view, um, looking for any medications that are associated with falls or morbidity um, and assessing that. And then obviously we've got allied health. So um, OTs and physios here at Fiona Stanley work trans-professionally, um, which I won't go into, but um, I'm sure some of you have heard of. So basically we complete the mobility and functional assessment as well as a cognitive screen um, to identify any impairments or anything that needs to be looked at um, in an inpatient setting or followed up with from an outpatient setting. And then we refer on to, you know, outpatient services such as 
falls clinic memory clinic um, we provide information education liaising with the doctors management of injuries um, and then make a bit of a discharge plan from that point and then you can see there our little um, pro forma those two are also taken as a snapshot from the falls pathway document so that's our section to kind of go through um, Another part of the falls pathway that's recently been added is the frailty score. I'm not sure how many hospitals are using this, but we've added it on as a valuable kind of part um, because it can guide discharge disposition and it highlights a key group of patients that benefit um, from an expedited discharge rather than an inpatient stay. So if you can see the score of four, five and six, so vulnerable, mildly frail and moderately frail, it's generally a group of patients that benefit from um, an expedited discharge or diverting care to the community where possible to avoid hospital acquired pneumonia, um, hospital acquired complications. So we know 35% of 70 year old patients um, or over experienced functional decline during a hospital admission. And for people who are over 90, this increases to 65%. And then 8% of patients admitted to hospital over the age of 70 will develop a delirium during their admission. So a few important points and, and reasoning behind why we try and get people home to their own environments, basically. Uh, the top little graph there is just a broken down version of the graph I showed you in the first slide that I talked to. So that discharge um, rate from ED in the bottom slide is um, having a look at another one of the project's aims, which was um, reducing length of stay for the patients that we did have to admit. And you can see it's quite successful in its goal there that in 2015 patients were staying upwards of five days, whereas in the last six months of 2021, that was kind of down at 1.9 days length of stay, which is another um, great so success that, of the path. For pathway. those, yes, yeah, so those who actually get discharged home, we don't have a graph, their um, length of stay is an average of between eight and nine hours as well for those who actually come through ED, bearing in mind that a lot of those, what increases the numbers, if they come in after five o'clock, we'll generally keep them mm. overnight yeah. so that they don't go home in the dark, um, you know, so they go home in the daytime hours with services and still then it's still eight to nine hours, which is pretty good. So mm. often, yeah. you know, those late afternoon ones will stay overnight. Yeah. Yeah. With the plan for discharge. Um, this just looks at the readmission rate in ED, which is stable when it generally hovers between 3 to 15 per cent, which is quite kind of standard. Um, so some, some of the outcomes, so the whole um, uh, meeting our aim of completely redesigning the way older people are managed in an emergency part and department with a fall, with um, even though there's lots of physical changes that we've organised, a lot of it is actually culture and actually getting used to everybody seeing these very acute patients in a short stay um, unit and a lot of culture change also with um, with the wards where the patients actually um, not no longer going by AMU directly to a geriatric ward. Um, we've definitely reduced their lengths of stay in ED as well as hospitalisation um, and we've certainly we're very very fortunate the hospitals did support us and that we actually, we didn't actually mention to be should have, um, we actually got a health department grant for two years. Apologies, that was an oversight. So thanks to the health department, we'd actually, um, quite a few hundred thousand dollars to be honest, which actually paid for the geriatricians and the allied health and the project money to actually set it up. So I was one of the project officers as well as doing the allied health role. And the hospital then took on the funding and have actually paid for ongoing geriatricians seven days a week, eight, and um, they're there from eight to 12 as well. So um, amazing that that's actually carried on and with the increased allied health presence as well. Um, so and a lot of liaison has happened with um, the geriatric wards with fast tracking the um, patients to geri geriatric wards. And again, that's a culture change with AMU doctors feeling like they missed out on this cohort of patients. But, um, you know, over the years now, it's just stock standard. Why don't they go to the Jerry's wards? They're more appropriate. We know that they're better managed to the right ward in the right place. And then as you can see, our numbers are just a quarter of what they were, 1.9 from days currently to 5.1 previously for mm. admission. So our cost savings with all those reduced lengths of stay is just huge, 4 million. 
Um, Alex is going to talk in a sec to our choice services, and this is an amazing service, so I'll hold that thought. And then Glenn and myself have written, as plus this, all those other names at the beginning, have written a, a paper, so if anyone wants to look at more details with um, actual figures and things, numbers coming through, that's actually in a paper that we've written. So a little quick slide on where to from, from now. Um, so CHOICE is a service that was set up um, a little while ago and it stands for Consider Home Over Inpatient Care Every Time. So basically um, it's an outpatient service um, and it allows us to send people home earlier with the kind of comfort to know that someone will see them the next day, whatever it might be that you require. So medical services, allied health, social work, nursing, um, they go out, they can see the patient in their own home environment. Um, and see what they're up to after they've been into the ED. Um, Sandy had a little story of... Um, oh, she's giving it to me. Yeah. <laughs> this I was is, trying to... <laughs> so this is a patient that actually was um, at a meeting with Adam, who's the manager of Choice Service. Adam is a physio, for those who don't know, who's actually set up the service, but he also does still, still do clinical work. And he just gave the description of a patient that presented on Tuesday to the emergency department, really wasn't keen on staying had an obvious vestibular disorder, but refused to be assessed in ED. Um, when Adam went and saw him, he'd already had another fall, picking up his newspaper, because you tip your head, for those who know, with being been over and gone. And he was able to, in his own home, quite safely treat him, convince him to have the treatment, because he was, the guy felt happier in his own home, mm -hmm. and um, check on him and any other services. So just saying how, um, I think Adam's motto is home is best. What is it? Um, yeah, yes, he's got home is where the heart home is. Home yes, is, home is where the heart is. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a helicopter being arriving at the hospital yeah. as well. So um, basically they're kind of just encouraging these early supportive discharges and then trying to do what they can from the home environment um, to improve the success rate of patients getting home. Um, we've got RATU that's uh, recently kind of established in 2021. It's the Rapid Assessment Treatment Unit at Fremantle Hospital. It's a geriatric ward and the aim is to get patients discharged home within four days or identify whether they might require longer term inpatient care. So there's just a little graph here um, of the patients that we've sent when it's transferred to Fremantle, transferred to 6D, which is our acute care of the elderly ward here at Fish or discharge. Um, so slowly those numbers that are going directly from ED to Frio are starting to climb, which is nice. So it's moving from the patients going directly into a ward here upstairs to our kind of secondary site at Frio, um, which is kind of like subacute and, and a bit less, you know, full on for the patients, but with the same goal in mind being that hopefully they get discharged within a shorter time frame from that ward. Um, VEM, which is um, the Virtual Emergency Medicine, was established in 2001 and basically it's kind of looking 20. at, oh yeah, 2021, and it's basically looking at um, kind of linking in with St John's, seeing where they can avoid patients coming to ED, so VEM patients coming straight um, from the front door straight to the short stay, not necessarily falls, but a lot of them are. Um, or VEM to RATU, which is Frio, or even VEM referring directly to CHOICE, so avoiding that um, admission to ET, ED altogether, which is a, new, a newish initiative. The noise cancelling headphones or earphones is just a, a project that's just been kind of submitted by one of the geriatricians, Shabana, and one of our OTs, Julia Murray, um, looking at trying to improve the geriatric patient's experience in the emergency department. So that's kind of watch that space. And then the commencement of a structured food service in the emergency department at Fiona Stanley. So a dedicated food service attendant providing meal and snacks, which is really important, especially for these um, false pathway patients who obviously need um, that nutrition to, to recover and hopefully successfully get them home. It might seem a small thing because we've actually been run by Serco. We actually had a very um, minimalist food budget in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. um, so a 70 bed emergency, we 
actually only had provision to provide food for 15 staff of hot meals. So it's taken seven years, but we've got there. <laughs> it might seem a very small thing, but for us, it's a really big thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely.